Hello, welcome to Pop Culture Sociology 307. My uh, name is Jan Todd and I'll be your instructor over the next six weeks. Before we get started, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how to contact me and um, we'll be over the next six weeks doing lots of assignments that will be uh, online, but I also want you to be able to be in uh, in relationship with me throughout so that if there is something you need help with, you can get a hold of me. My most preferred method of getting a hold of uh, me at any time is my cell. I prefer texts. Um, 913-553-0267 is my cell phone number as listed on the screen. I also am available for a phone call if you need to uh, talk about something in more depth or if something comes up during the six weeks. I also can be reached at, e at my email, although I do not check it as often as I do my cell phone as I'm addicted to my phone, but uh, feel free to call, uh, contact me at jtodd at emporia.edu. And also I'm giving my Google uh, account um, that, or my Google access account. It's um, when you do a Google doc, which a lot of people will upload, I need access to be able to grade that. And so I use my Emporia state or my um, Kansas State University account for that, JET7979 at ksu.edu. And so those are my contact numbers. Feel free throughout the whole course to contact me there. All right, let's get started. See, so look at the six weeks. You know, we may have a general idea of what the term popular culture means, but the text that we'll be using in the next um, six weeks, we will break that down into particular genres and venues, and also looking at how groups interpret what popular culture is. But the general idea of behind popular culture is that it is a culture that is present and current in an environment where we are currently working and playing and presenting ourselves. And we're belonging to it in order to find identity and meaning. And it's not something that we're trying to belong to that was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but is of the now. And it is constantly evolving. Now at this level, we've looked at culture from lots of perspectives, including over time, knowing that culture is shaped and changed um, based on what society is doing. And so uh, I wanna remind us of some of the phrases we've learned through our earlier sociological uh, education and knowing that some of your basic terms are gonna be used again here, but then redefined a little bit based on uh, the space in which we're looking at what's popular. So culture is something we create, and it's not something you can create by yourself. It's something that is done in social relationship as social beings acting as agents with other people who uh, help then through some sort of uh, buy-in of values and norms um, and some beliefs that uh, create the society that we live in. And culture is also something where we, uh, through these values, the group members continue to create goods and um, all kinds of material means that shape our lives. For example, if you lived in Kansas 150 years ago, your society, your culture would be shaped by the agricultural settlement of the state and there wouldn't be much industry based on um, some sort of uh, machinery that didn't involve cows, cattle, some sort of uh, horses or mules to take care of the agricultural, agricultural society. But currently we live in a system of agriculture that has uh, large corporate farms that um, even if you are a family farm owner, you've invested in maybe John Deere tractors that can cost the amount of a large house um, and have GPS on them. And those goods are a reflection of what's going on in the culture at the time. So that gives you an idea, maybe an example of how we look at that. It's also important to be aware of the difference between values, norms, and material goods. So values are ideas. They're easily changed compared to beliefs. When we buy into a, a value, um, we're buying into something that a lot of people get behind and say, uh, for example, that um, you value individualism and you should be able to pull yourself up from your bootstraps um, and be able to have the most opportunities to do that. Well, certain societies hold that as a high value and that's part of their culture, but other cultures might buy into more communal, um, egalitarian uh, sharing of what 
um, society as a whole can do to raise everybody up together. So a value is something that really you, you don't necessarily uh, fully have to believe in it, but it's an idea that you think is relevant. You can also change your values over time. Uh, maybe you had the idea about that individualism when you were younger and as you got older, you found that you needed more community over time. Um, so that's something that we kind of play with in how it shapes our culture and our identity. Norms are really the rules of a society that enacts the values that the group holds and also a lot of times the beliefs. So we call these the do's and don'ts of society. And finally, again, the material goods are the things that we make um, and they influence the way we live. For example, as we were talking earlier, people make um, probably uh, a lot of um, their living in the agricultural world, not just being out on the farm, but there are people that are working through Cargill and um, John Deere, and they have, John, uh, they have engineering jobs or manufacturing jobs um, that basically are shaped around the agricultural life, and that reflects the material uh, world that we live in currently, whereas we're probably not making it as many plows uh, that are being hauled by um, mules. So those are some ideas that remind our uh, minds a little bit about what we've learned before. Another thing we have to recognize about culture is there are always subcultures and breakoffs in larger culture and we're going to see that in uh, a lot of ways through studying popular culture. Examples might be, for example, um, thinking about smartphones. Um, we all have smartphones or a large portion of us have access to smartphones. It's almost a part of our everyday life and um, expected to be uh, a part of a person, um, person's everyday experience. Um, even if you don't have a computer, you might have a smartphone. The thing is there are subcultures that are often based on brand. Uh, you will see people who buy into the iPhone and Apple culture, uh, and a lot of times there are even arguments about which is better, the Droid versions or the iPhone versions, um, whether Samsung is uh, actually part of the millennial generation, which seems to uh, be something that a lot of people say, um, and the iPhone is for older generations. Even at my uh, growing up in the in my early 20s and early 30s, there was another brand called BlackBerry that you've probably never even heard of, but there was a whole culture base based around um, having this very accessible keyboard um, and the way in which that operated. That may not sound like subculture, but you basically organize your life around those types of uh, operating systems and therefore there's some culture built into that. Another example might be how you do social media. If I think about how I do social media versus how you do it, um, I post, you might tweet, or you might snap. Um, and it just depends on how you prefer to present yourself. And we have a lot of other types of uh, social media, but those icons of a bird or an F or a little funky ghost thing are parts of a culture that we might uh, buy into more than others. So what makes popular culture popular? The most important answer to this question is you. You make popular, uh, popular culture popular because you may or may not buy into it. Um, and it's based on mass voting, really, um, based on the commodities, lifestyles, and culture that the world tends to present in mass. And we'll look at the different ways in which uh, popular culture is experienced in an intersection, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's one popular culture. It means there are several different cultures um, that might have large popular followings, icons, celebrities, and experiences. The way we're going to look at it through this next six weeks is through four general uh, genres. First is music. Um, anything that has to do with music in the industry. Um, the ways in which we share music, buy music, um, create our own playlists, and buy into the artists behind that. We'll also look at video um, based on looking at TV culture, movie culture, and understanding that we might be a Netflix culture that uh, basically gets into series. Binge watching will be something we talk about in this. Um, lots of different series that people watch in mass and then share about online. Um, and that's one of the uh, most important things to recognize is um, 
in each one of these videos, they'll bleed into the other. And so it leads to the next piece, which is fashion, how you dress, how you relate to a culture. Um, if you're a Kenny Chesney fan, you're probably going to dress a little differently than a person who is a Beyonce Jay-Z fan um, and or maybe a person who um, is a Bjork fan, which you probably don't even know who that is. Um, but it's one of those things that, although I will say, Lord Lourdes just said that Bjork was one of her favorites, which made me happy. Um, but we look at these things and they bleed into each other. And then finally, uh, a lot of times we process this through the social media that we participate in um, and present ourselves. So these four areas are what we're gonna be looking at in more detail and using theory to uh, look at. And also our final project will involve all four of those areas. Defining popular culture as we all participate it, uh, in, in it is also a sense of a voting system, meaning we vote through our participation um, and we all play a part in this popularity. And it's not like this where you're trying to win homecoming queen and get a crown and a bunch of roses. It's more like this where your dollars say a lot or your ideas or what you share publicly. And so I want you to think about how you participate in popular culture by being an influencer because everything you buy, everything you wear, everything you say online and the music that you share says something about who you are and associates with you with the type of culture which is often part of that mass popular culture. As a consumer of popular, popular culture then as you vote and make that sense of um, yourself know, you might find yourself more not in the popular culture, but in a subculture. Subcultures still, by the way, have large votes. It's just not as high of a vote. Uh, so for example, more people will vote for Taylor Swift because they've bought more of her albums, but you might be somebody who um, really likes independent music and local artists you still have a sense of possible, uh, a possible connection with popular culture because there's a whole group of people that prefer maybe to go to jazz clubs and or go to uh, places that nobody would ever think is popular, but it may be kind of rumbling underneath that that might be the new next thing. And you might be creating popular culture because your subculture that is changing the mood of what maybe people have gotten tired of over time. So know that you're always participating in it. It just might be at a different level of what people think are popular. For example, we look at the top grossing concerts of 2018. This list, Ed Sheeran, Taylor Swift, Beyonce and Jay-Z, Bruno Mars, Pink, U2, Journey and Def Leppard, Kenny Chesney, The Rolling Stones and Justin Timberlake. There is a wide variety of people that are represented in those concerts alone. You may look at this list and say, I didn't go to any of those. In fact, I don't listen to a single person <laughs> that is on there, but you probably know their music in one way or another. However, you might be a person that says, I have all of these on my playlist and I listen to Ed Sheeran and Beyonce and Jay-Z and Journey and Def Leppard on a regular basis. So you're gonna find those intersections where at times you might be highly embedded and invested in the popular culture of the time. And at other times, you might find yourself um, not invested in that same link of life, um, but maybe creating some other ways to look at it. We're going to be, by the way, using David Grazian's Mix It Up Popular Culture, Mass Media, and Society book um, as a reference. I have suggested that you buy it. Um, actually, I've suggested that you rent it. It's $20. And for the amount of time that we're working uh, together, uh, that might be helpful for you throughout. However, I'm not requiring that you buy the book, but I am going to use it several times uh, throughout the course for us to reference uh, what popular culture is and how um, that experience has been uh, defined through the sociological lens. Dave Grazian suggests five complementary definitions of popular culture, and I want you to know those by the end of this lecture today. The first definition is popular culture is well-liked, meaning if you looked at the larger society, people like it. And it, again, does not mean that you in, as an individual might not like it, but that society for some reason is showing some interest. For example, hashtag GOT. You either know or don't know what that means. Yes, it means Game of Thrones. 
And a lot of times, even if you've not participated in the culture of Game of Thrones, you have been made uh, aware of it through exposure, either online, friends using the terms, or trying to share and not do spoilers. Um, but then you have to look, sometimes there's cultures within cultures, and they're both popular culture. For example, a large culture of Game of Thrones is really based around the books and the cosplay, and they're not necessarily as interested in what was presented on HBO. Um, a lot of people never read the books, and so they're more embedded in the popular culture of the HBO series. And there's a group that might compare both. In fact, I know of a lot of podcasts that break it down. How much did that match the book? Um, did they mess with the storyline? Was it a horrible storyline on HBO or was it better? Um, so that's important for us to recognize is that even in a large subcultural connection of it being well-liked, well-liked does not necessarily mean the whole entire group that's following this as a popular culture agrees. They just like the idea of the genre. Now, let's say you haven't participated in it, is participated in either watching the show or also paying attention to the books. You still may know the words, and that's the thing about popular culture. It will uh, bleed into your life basically through your friends and your association. So you may not know um, much about the storyline, but when you say Dracarius, you know that it's associated with this person right here and that it's not a very good thing if that word is said to you because you'll be um, basically talking about being killed by fire. Shame, not a word that we all like, but in particular with this series, that word is used in relationship to Circe. And um, that's something that you might hear your friends saying, shame, as kind of a uh, iconic uh, phrase. And then finally, the most important phrase that we heard for so long uh, is winter is coming. And um, even, again, if you've not participated in this culture, these types of phrases can find their way into your vocabulary. Definition two, popular culture refers to icons and celebrities. It is something that happens uh, on people that we identify with as either our heroes or heroines, um, people that uh, represent the culture that we're part of. For example, I go back to Jay-Z and um, Beyonce. They released an album under the title The Carters, and they had a massive tour um, that involved everything about who they were as billionaire celebrities who have worked from the bottom to the top to make their empire. Everything that their icon represents and their brand represents is into the sense of luxury, hard work, and culture that um, is built around who they are as people. Now, you look at this other example, top 10 YouTubers, and it's a totally different genre market and understanding of icon and celebrity. Whereas both of them have tons of followers in different ways, and you may even participate in being a strong YouTuber and also at the same time listening to Beyonce and Jay-Z's album. You also are part of a distinct audience. They are not trying to get both of you. They have created their own cultures that are popular and that people have bought into. And um, it's important to recognize that icon and celebrity creates a lot of distinction and sometimes even segregates uh, the conditions in which we find ourselves adhering to that popular culture. Another way to look at that also is by brand. Um, if you have icons such as the Apple, which again, I was really surprised by this, the top 10 millennial brands, Apple is up. Um, and that was not something I'd heard. I'd heard Samsung was really kicking its butt. So. Um, I think that's interesting. Nike, Sony, um, buying at Target, these all things are important for us to, to see that we wear a lot of times the icons. Definition three, pop culture refers to communal media and mass culture with a target audience. As referred to in the previous definition, this target audience is somebody that gets together. It's not just about the fact that there's icons and celebrities, but they expect you to be in spaces, either online, maybe in person at a concert or an event, 
and that popular culture refers to a large amount of people saying I was there um, and I'm part of that audience and so I look I take in what that looks like another example of this I often find is that um, we can see target audiences being developed on websites like Trend Hunter, uh, which talks about monthly trend, trends. And you start to see people develop a sense of community around these trends. And you recognize that there's a target audience um, with these kinds of uh, either clothing or music that they're highlighting. So that's kind of a fun uh, website uh, to go on to. I've put the link here and I'll attach it also um, in a file so that you can go look at that. So then definition four, again, refers to the last definition, but takes it a little bit step, a little step farther, where not only you're expected to be together um, or connect to that pop culture in a way that you belong, but you create that sense of belonging by buying into um, the whole entire spectacle. So I'm looking with these two examples at the spectacle, spectacle of sports and the arena of looking at professional football. Now, the Philadelphia Eagles, you have to be a true fan because a long time they were not very good. And that's like a really long time. But the fans themselves have continued to show up. They've continued to create a sense of belonging and they're the only ones that can make fun of their team. Whereas anybody that comes in, they're known to be a football team that by the way is pretty rough and tough <laughs> if you make fun of them. Um, you see this strong eagle icon and this connection to this team. That whole idea of the Philadelphia Eagles and the pop popular culture that is embedded in them is going to look different than the Denver Broncos. Denver Broncos have had many teams go to the Super Bowl. It's set in a different part of the world where Philly is known as more of an industrial town, hardworking, a little bit in. Uh, of the coal mining industry nearby, whereas Denver Broncos are uh, in the middle of the mountains, the Rocky Mountains, and it has this sense of um, kind of more affluent uh, kind of community. And these two arenas, even though these two teams go up and against each other, the presentation of belonging is different. They have different rituals. They have different ways of getting at um, their fanship and they all show up and they belong, but it's very distinct and again, segregated based on how people have um, embedded that. Then there's Corky. I bring him on as a definition of this as well, belonging, because uh, you know, college uh, icons and flying to college is very different than going to a pro team. And Corky represents to us, not just Emporia State, sports but like every part of being part of Emporia State whether you're the debate team or the choir or the drama department and so there's a sense of a, a crossover an intersection here that happens in college representation of belonging and you know recognizing that it's part of higher education um, than that of the arenas of professional sports so it's important to recognize we are belonging to things but often in different ways with different rituals Another way in which the media events, which definition five talks about popular culture refers to media events. Um, it's not just about showing up in the presence of the space itself, but, and it's also um, not necessarily just looking at the celebrity or the icon or the phrases, but it's also the idea that you're participating in something that spatially may have only happened once. Um, this was the event. Um, it's not going to be reproduced. You can't just, you know, continue to go to the games. For example, Super Bowls, they continuously disappoint us <laughs> because there's not always a great game there. But if we happen to see a great game, if you were tuned in, um, if you're connecting to the commercials, even if the game was horrible and or the halftime entertainment, there's a sense of you being and referring to that one media event in that one space and time that pop culture creates. This is the most uh, quickly fleeting of all of them, <laughs> of all the definitions, meaning because it doesn't reproduce, you can't just continue to put you two um, or Beyonce or, um, you know, Coldplay in the middle of an arena at the Super Bowl and expect the same uh, results. But 
it has that sense of you have been there for that event. Same with like Lady Gaga concert. She has different concerts each time she goes out. So this time around on this tour, you're connecting to that event in that particular space. And March Madness, I often bring that to the table. We all might uh, feel compelled to fill out an entire bracket for teams that we've never heard of, have no idea how they're going to land. But for example, if your team makes it all the way to the final four, you're suddenly connecting to that one event in this one space of time um, that you can hold on to for a little bit. And then it starts all over again. So all of these definitions help us to recognize that we are people that really do find popular culture important, even if we want to reject it or think that we're rejecting it. Um, so this week, we're going to explore how you're defined by the popular culture you buy into and also into the popular culture you don't participate in. Um, it's important to recognize our spaces where we have identified ourselves based on the things that we like, our tastes, um, and our uh, understanding that we buy into things literally sometimes with our own dollars um, that create our own culture and our own sense of belonging. Again, thank you for uh, participating, listening today. Remember to post, have fun with this class, respond to your classmates, and know that I'm reachable at these numbers and emails. Have a good week.